Hi, I'm David Norman, Managing Director of Deed Solar. Today we are at a 10 kilowatt solar installation with a six and a half kilowatt battery storage here in Dartford, one of my neighbours, and it worked in the event of a power cut, emergency power switching, love it, let's go. So we're up on the roof and we've got 12 410 JAs on the main building and we've got 10 on the garage roof. So we probably could have got a few more on the main but we stuck with um, 12 could it just aesthetically look better um, rather than kind of maximising on all of the room we chose for the aesthetics as well because it's on the front of the house. Um, so we've got 12 410 JAs. Um, we went for Blackbird protection as well, just um, so you know it looks a bit more swanky, <laughs> a bit nicer on the roof. Um, so it blends in well with uh, you know the, the frame of the modules. Um, to be honest, you can't actually see it from from off of the scaffold down on the ground. So it definitely worked well. Um, so we've got yeah six panels at the top of the roof, six panels at the bottom of the roof and then 10 panels on the garage. And we've got a six kilowatt hybrid and then a two and a half kilowatt string inverter. We want it to go with a hybrid um, to keep the conversion DC to AC on the DC side. One for the DNO because um, any AC coupled grid connected storage system, the, the grid treat as a threat. So they account for the full storage size. So we wanted to keep the storage on the DC side of the system, um, which means we can really sort of vamp up the amount of storage if we ever want to, without limitation on the grid. And the biggest hybrid we could get was the six kilowatt. So we've done um, six panels, six times 410, which go into the two and a half kilowatt as one string. And then we've got the six, which go into the six kilowatt hybrid as one string. And then the 10, which go into the other MPPT tracker on the hybrid add another string so we've got three strings in total um and works out perfectly so um happy with the roof happy with the garage quite a long run dc run to get from the garage to the inverter about 15 meters so we calculated the bolt drop hence why the oversizing is there you get about a 30 percent tolerance on oversizing not that we typically use that and then that, that varies between brand and inverter and so on but Everything here is working perfectly and um, I think it's getting quite cold up here because we can get off, off the roof now but not much to see. Panels on a roof, done properly and doing what they need to be doing. Shame there ain't enough sunlight. Let's go. We've got our um, conduit, obviously underground here, where we've got Cat 5s run through for our communications between things, but all of that in an outside box that goes round. And then over here, we have our distribution board um, for the solar, also managing the emergency power switching as well, um, which works out quite nicely because it's you know, clear cover so we can see in here what we've got in there. So we'll go around and look at the inverters. And then we have our electrical setup. So another sub distribution board, type A pulsated RCD for the inverters. Um, we've got a hybrid inverter, string inverter, six and a half kilowatt battery, manuals, isolation, generation meter, that's it. So 
we've got the panel from the garage coming into here, six on the lower part of the main roof coming into the six kilo inverter, the six on the top part of the roof coming into the two and a half kilo inverter here, and then everything that's then generated from the solar that's not being used in the house is then picked up by the battery, charging the battery, and also the same measuring devices are telling the battery when to charge and discharge. Um, should there be a grid failure and, uh, you know, loss of network on the grid side, then um, the battery will automatically change over on, uh, on an ATS switch in, which is what we looked at uh, on the other meter. And, um, and it will autonomously kick in. The battery will then power the home um, using up whatever's in the storage based on what the home is demanding. Now, uh, like I said, you can go up to seven of these six and a half kilowatt batteries, so you really could bulk it out. Um, but, you know, bat batteries are expensive. Once you have all of this system installed, you can then kind of gather the data and see really how much storage you actually need um, based on, you know, the, the, the data from the monitoring side of the system. And then you can just add them on easy enough. So started small and we'll see how big he goes. I reckon he'll probably have another one next year, we'll see. Um, yeah, generation meter. He's done 74 kilowatts so far. So not bad at all, especially this time of year. And um, yeah, I'm sure he's happy with that. 74 kilowatts, he's not had to pay, what is it? 32 pence at the minute? kilowatt I think going up to 40 so happy days So what is unique about this system? Um, we have a emergency power supply, otherwise known as EPS. Um, a lot of inverters have the capability now to have EPS. So it's kind of built into the hardware, um, but it's not offered uh, or installed by installers. Um, and to be honest, I've seen in my working experience, a lot of time where the customers at the end of the interval go, oh, so if we have a power cut, it will work. Well, no, not unless you've installed the emergency power supply and it's been fitted. Um, and I actually don't know many people that do it or, or know how to do it. I think it's quite a gray area um, from like the engineering side. Um, so, you know, why would you need um, emergency power supply. Well, it, I think it's like a leisure item, right? It's a luxury. It's not going to improve your return of investment. So, you know, you need to make the decision on, is it right for you? Could I, are you buying solar st strictly for savings or, you know, the options there, it's in the hardware. Um, now there is an extended price to install um, EPS, although it's built into the hardware, there's a lot of external work that has to go into installing it. Um, for example, you have to have um, switching, whether it's manual switching or automatic switching. In this case, we've used ATS switch, um, automatic transfer switch, so that you're, you know, we, we get that autonomous changeover. Um, so what I mean by that is if the grid goes down, this will automatically switch straight onto battery and power the desired circuits that we choose to have in the home on the supplier. Um, now, you, you you know you you get um, different amounts of power from uh, what the battery can offer. So this is a three kilowatt charge discharge um, system. So we can get up to three kilowatt of power at one given time. Most homes typically have a base load of about five hundred watt. So, um, you know, you don't need the three kilowatt necessarily, especially in the event of a power cut. 
um, but it's there if you need it. Um, you know, so something like this, if the power goes down now and we lose power on the grid, the battery's going to kick in. Um, they're going to be able to have the lights on. They're going to have tellies on. That's pretty much all they're going to do. They're going to know that they're running off the battery and they're not going to go around putting the kettle on in the oven. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, it is nice to have. If you've got a newborn baby, we had this once and, you know, newborn baby, grid goes down baby's up crying you need to make a bottle you can't boil the kettle you've got an electric cob you've got a battery so there's like you know there is a, a luxury side to it which is quite nice and functional but then also like you might have someone who's in the home who's ill who's got um you know machines that are operating support machines and that might then become a bit more justified in that scenario so there's like uh, you know, there's various scenarios. If you're out in the countryside and you're seeing frequent power cuts on an overhead power supply line on the TT supply, you know, it's going to make more sense for you. We charge £1,500 to do it. And how that cost is kind of how we got to that figure after um, quite a few installations was... So when you lose the grid, you lose the earth in arrangement as well, um, which the earth is there to protect the property in the event of a fault or if there was danger and it draws the power down to ground rather than to, you know, for, for it to be a risk. So we install a stern, an external earth stake so that there is, um, you know, an external earth for the system when it goes off grid. So the home's protected and the people in it. Um, we have to have um, the switch in. So when the switch in kicks in, you can either have a manual changeover switch where when the grid goes, you manually push it onto battery by switching it. And um, we've got an automatic switch, so it will uh, autonomously kick in without any, you won't have to touch anything. Um, so we install ATS switching, um, we install external earths, uh, there's contactors on the circuit. And then obviously there's the consumer unit that's, desire, um, that's bespoke for the um, emergency power supply, which basically, you know, we have the desired circuits for what we want to use in the event of a power cut. Um, so it's just quite intricate in terms of the installation. It's more, um, you know, labor intense rather than the, uh, it's the amount of components involved. So, um, but then it's justifying that cost, 15 pounds a lot of money, you know, do how much do I want to have that luxury? I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently. We've seen a huge blow up in the demand for people inquiring about off uh, off grid or backup power or island power. You know, um, the inverters working in island mode, etc. So there's a huge demand for it at the minute because of what we're seeing in the news. People saying about blackouts and so on and. You know, everyone wants to be that house in the street that's got lights on when everyone else hasn't. <laughs> so there's like a huge demand for it. And um, like, don't get me wrong, I think it's something that, you know, you should kind of have. If you've got solar, you've gone through that huge cost, you've got solar, you've got a battery, you've got the capability of the hardware, you know, for what it is, is it, you know, who knows what's around the corner. We're using 100 kilowatt car batteries, you know, there's no um, assurances on supply at the moment, power supply, where it's coming from, who we're buying it from, how we're sourcing it. You know, so there's all of these question marks in, in this industry. Um, so why not have that kind of independence? You know, so not, it's definitely a nice to have. Um, but, you know, that's EPS. Um, we do, we, we're doing a lot more. We're getting a lot of inquiries. Um, most inverters, if you've got solar and you've got an inverter, like I say, hybrids typically, I think majority do. AC coupled controllers, I think again, majority do. They're the few brands that don't. Um, some of them you'll need to buy an external component to go with it, but um, the majority are built in anyway. So, um, and you might even find a competent electrician who can kind of, you know, do it for you, but from what I know, I don't think there's a lot of installers that are trained and educated in emergency power supply. So, you know, do have some caution around who you're speaking to, ensure they understand 
um, the you know technical design of it and um, the electrical design and make sure it's um, you know they they know what they're doing. Um, but yeah. So this is our main supply for the EPS and when I say supply it's sort of coming the other way isn't it it's coming from the inverter to the to the building um, so you have to get the cable from the inverter to sorry the cat that just made Claudia <laughs> jump now don't <laughs> hopefully she keeps saying so there's um, yeah you have to get from A to B so you have a inverter which will either be in your loft or in your garage and you need to be able to then get the cable from that inverter to power obviously the, um, the design circuits to bring that power basically back from the battery into the home and that's in in adjacent to your existing um, cables that you need anyway to make it all work <clears throat> so if you already got a system you're then having to run another supply in Typically, depending on the storage size, a four, six mil um, to be able to carry the power. But yeah, so bear that in mind. So we've got that running from the inverter to here and then in here and nothing's labeled yet. We still have to label it. So we're waiting for that um, to be done, but you can kind of gauge what you've got. So it comes through, you've got all of your switching here, um, contactors, and uh, that's bringing the power in, making it autonomous, switching it over, chucking it back into our desired circuit. And uh, yeah, so just something to bear in mind is obviously that cable route people, you know, it's always a bit old, so we've got to have another cable put in. But yes, you do need another cable, need to have another big box put somewhere inside. The reason the box is so big is there's big power cables internally in there that go from A to B and make everything work. Um, but that's something that's required. Hopefully you enjoyed watching the video, um, you've learned something new, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow.